All right. Hey, open your Bibles real quick. I want to talk about a few things today. I've been on a series called The Turning. The Turning. The Turning is all about repentance. It really comes out of that Second Chronicles passage that says, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, turn, turn from their wicked ways, that he will come and heal our land, answer them, and heal our land. Our land right now, called the United States, is under huge attack. I mean, hackers, and I don't know. I don't know who the enemies are. They're all over. I mean, everyone's getting accused right now of doing something, trying to mess with our elections, corruption, all these things going on, burning of cities, uh, pandemic. What a year this has been, you know. But it is a year where the Lord is in the midst of it. What and how the Lord has done in all that. I'm really loud up here on stage, if we can back that down a little bit, getting an echo up here. The Lord is, um, he's in the midst of this, doing mighty things. And it may be above my pay grade right now to know everything that God's doing across America, but I know he's involved in it. And I know one thing from sure from what I read in Scripture That God is using this moment, whether he created it, the enemy created it, it was a natural, whatever happened, he's using this moment to draw people into the purpose of God. All over the Old Testament, the Lord shapes economies, shapes environments in order to draw, because of his great love, it's almost like we do not understand how good it is when you're fully in the love of God. If we did, we'd run to it. But we, we veer in other ways. Some people get very religious, which is just as bad. Other people get lawless, which is pretty bad and affects your entire family. Whether it's it's law or lawlessness, God's calling us to his divine love, the very shed blood of Jesus Christ, that his blood comes and touches you in order to transform you and create in you to be a person that is Jesus-like or Christ-like. It's one of the huge intentions of heaven is you to be shaped into the very image of Jesus. And the New Testament church actually was accused of that. They were called Christians, little, little Jesuses, little Christ. It was meant to be a, uh, a derogatory comment, but it actually became kind of a banner for the early church. We are Christians, and to this day we use that term, you know. In the Bible, we're also called saints. Now, this is a hard word for us today because saint is such a highly spiritual term. I mean, that, that saints are like a Catholic church has only had a number of those that have arisen to the level of saint. We'll just call Saint Stephen right now. It feels pretty good to say that. Saint Stephen, you know. Saint, though, is a word used often throughout the New Testament it's, it's uh, the, the Greek word is uh, hagion, which means, it means a couple things, you know, depending on context, but it is, it is separate and sacred, separate and sacred. That these saints that every one of us become in Jesus Christ through his shed blood, when we ask him into our lives, we become saints. Literally, it means holy ones. Let's do this in faith. I, I, we're going we're to turn to one another. And, and if you don't know their name, maybe ask them their name first. And then we're just going to turn and say, hey, Saint Cindy. Hey, Saint Christopher. Now that does sound like a saint, Saint Christopher. Saint Christopher. Hey, Saint Mary Beth. Okay, we're going to do that in a minute. Because I want to I wanna get it into your ears that you can hear your name with saint attached to it. Is that okay? You're not apostle today. You're not prophet. You're saint. Okay, we're going to go with saint. Everybody ready? Do you know the person that's, you may shout, have to shout it out because of social distancing or whatever. So have a little conversation right now. Make sure you got their name. Okay, a little conversation going on. All right. Here we go. So turn to one, turn person on the right, turn person on the left and say, hello, saint, whoever. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh-oh, babies are crying. All right, hopefully that felt pretty good. Well, here's the deal. When you became a believer, God called you holy. Do you know from heaven's perspective, you're holy. 
From heaven's perspective, you're forgiven. From heaven's per- perspective, from heaven's perspective, you're righteous. Righteous means right standing with God. In other words, you're okay. God looks, say, I'm good, I'm good, you're good, we're all right, everything's all right, I'm righteous. But our righteousness is we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Outside of Jesus, you're not righteous. Outside of Jesus, you're not holy. Outside of Jesus, you're not forgiven. You do have to turn, that's the whole point of this message, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and his absolute love, which means you turn away from certain things in your life. In fact, the apostle Peter, when he spoke in Acts chapter, I believe it was in chapter three, he said, when they said, you know, what should we do? He said, turn from this perverse generation. Be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, which is promised to you and all who are afar off. In other words, there comes time in our life where there's an absolute turning where you say, I'm not gonna follow the path I'm following now. I'm gonna follow Jesus Christ. I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna call to him. I'm gonna learn of him. Yeah. And part of that learning of him is realizing you're not just in a little raft cruising down a river. There is some rowing in this river. The rowing is not to be loved by God and accepted by God. You are loved by God. You are accepted by God. The rowing is you partnering with the Holy Spirit and his wind to get where God's called you to be. That you might be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is our number one goal is worshiping Lord, the Lord with our lives. Do you know, it says, this is a great scripture. I'm gonna read it out of... Uh, some place that's just disappeared on my computer. Hold on a minute. This happens every week. Talk among yourselves there. Let's see. Oh yeah, Romans 12. I could have quoted it, but I know it by heart in New King James, but not in the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation in Romans chapter 12 says this. Now hold on to this because here's, here's what I'm getting in a nutshell. In a nutshell, you were declared holy you probably read about a guy named Joshua in the Old Testament, not the one who brought the city walls down. There's another Joshua who's a priest. And he was in captivity. I think it's in Zechariah. He comes out of captivity and he's standing there with filthy rags, Babylon kind of rags. He's just broken. Somebody who's been taken out of their homeland into another place as a slave. He had to change his name. All these things had to happen. He is totally broken. And the the enemy, Satan, is in the presence of God welcoming this captive back. And the enemy is taunting him. He loves doing that. He's the robber, the killer, and destroyer. By the way, that wasn't God. That was the devil there taking your money, you know. He's a robber. He's a killer, destroyer. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. When you've got something about someone that's a lie in your head, it ain't God putting it there. That's the devil putting it there. And so, so we're in situations where the devil was there with Joshua, but also with the Lord. Here's the Lord's response. I love this. One of my favorite passages in Zechariah. He says this. He says to the devil, the Lord says this. He says, isn't this a brand plucked from the fire? That's the Lord taunting the devil. The Lord's saying to the devil, wait a minute. Didn't you have him, but now you don't have him anymore? He's over here. Now, he's there in filthy rags. And so the enemy, in his attempts to taunt this priest, the Lord speaks over it and basically says this, bring, a new, bring new clothing for him. Put robes upon him. Put sandals upon his feet. And this is the part I like. Put a turban on his head. I've always wanted to wear a turban. It kind of feels, feels like that'd be cool, you know. I'm sure it's not, but it would feel that way. And the turban, he says, right on the turban, holy to the Lord. So he takes someone that is, I mean, when you look at it biblically in the Hebrew, these are like rags are full of, it's gross. I mean, the man stinks. He's got dung in his rags on his clothing. He's, he's in an awful position. And the enemy is taking advantage of that. You've been broken. You are poor. You are a slave. You're not a child of God. But the Lord comes in and basically redresses him 
redresses him in righteousness, redresses him and calls him holy. Do you know how much that aggravates hell when you come to realize that you are holy unto the Lord? Now here's the deal. Holiness in the kingdom is, is, is kind of not unlike righteousness. Holiness is a, is a, let's call it, I know it's a gift from God because of salvation through Jesus Christ, but let's call this holiness an identity that is imprinted in you that is meant to become a destiny that comes out of you. I mean, you're imprinted with this to do it. If you're going around saying, I'm a carpenter, I'm a carpenter, I'm a carpenter, what have you built? Well, I'm a carpenter. Well, show me something you built. I'm a carpenter. I know how to build things. Have you built anything? Well, no, I haven't built anything, but I'm a carpenter. A lot of Christians walk around doing that. I'm an electrician, I'm an electrician, I'm an electrician. Well, w- what have you wired? Oh, I'm an electrician, I know how to do it. Have you done anything? No, I haven't done it. It's interesting in Scripture, I wanna make sure I don't get off track here. In Scripture, though, when Jesus talks about this whole complexity of understanding what our life is really supposed to be like on this side of heaven, he says, a man built his house Upon the sand. No, we'll go with the rock first. He went with the rock first. A man built his house upon the rock. And he says, it is those who hear and do. So they they hear and they act upon it. The man who builds his house upon the sand are those who hear only. Now, in my opinion, I believe we're talking about two types of Christians, followers of Jesus. There are people that have heard the word over here but have not done anything. There's a foundation of sand and the same storms come upon both of them. Pandemics, cities burning, laid off, jobs ending, financial difficulty, being robbed, whatever it might be, it comes against them. But they said, the house on the rock, which are people that hear and do. They hear and do. They are in partnership with heaven on earth. That one over there may understand their identity, but they don't understand their destiny also, that they are meant to do something out of that righteousness, holiness, and purity that's been declared and imputed upon their very soul. That when the rains come, that the house on the rock stood firm. But the house on the sand went... We know that from Sunday school, right? It went flat. I mean, it came in. It, and, and we're seeing now people falling away from the Lord all over the country. Some notable people are falling away from the Lord. They had theories. They had understanding. They had thoughts. But if you're living your Christian life on something that you did 12 years ago, praying a little prayer, and nothing has come out of you to move you closer to the very image and purposes of God, I wonder about those kinds of conversions. I do. There are counterfeit conversions. People have a feel-good moment, feel-good moment, bought their fire insurance, I'm gonna go to heaven. But the rest of their lives, there's little of Jesus in there. They just create a little 90-minute period on Sunday morning to get up and watch in their jammies with a coffee in their hand. And that makes them feel better. But the truth is, we are warriors, we are an army, we're a family, we're moving forth in the purposes of God. It's necessary for us to be together and be conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. (laughs) That's one of the the, the missions of the church, really, is to aggravate one another. Isn't that great to know that? Welcome to Bethel Cleveland, where we aggravate one another. I used to tell people in the intro talk that that's, I may offend you sometime. You know, we just need, can you just forgive me ahead of time for any offense I might bring? This is in the intro talk for people coming into the church. After a few years, I realized that probably wasn't the best approach for sales, you know, and getting people to come into the church and be a part of it. So I got rid of it, but it's what I used to say. I used to say, look, we're all gonna offend you. Welcome to Bethel. <laughs> so let's just, let's just pre-forgive and say, I'm going to love you. Because the truth is, you go to any church in town, you're going to end up offended. We're somewhere. So ahead of time, we're going to say, you know, I forgive you. I'm going to learn to love you so much, it's going to be easy to forgive you. That is moving in righteousness and holiness before the Lord. Now, the Lord has declared us holy, but guess what? He's called you also to act holy. 
Well, see, all, the same thing happened in Middleburg. Got really quiet when I said that. They're like, wait, what, what is it? What does that mean? He's called you as a holy person, but now he calls you to live this thing out in your daily conduct. Holiness has to get into your money. <laughs> holiness, has, holiness has to get into your just looking around a minute. And your sex life. Let's make sure there weren't many children in here. <laughs> Holiness needs to get into your relationships. Holiness has to get into how you do business. Holiness has to get into how you file your taxes. Holiness has to get into how you vote. Well, what does that look like? You know, the, the scripture is full of it. And most of those verses are not marked up in your Bible. <laughs> we only mark up verses that encourage us in the moment. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, he's a hope. Hope for my future. And he's, he's a direction and a peace for my life. I love that. Underline, underline, underline. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Arrow, arrow, arrow. <laughs> and right beneath it is, put off this, put on this. I don't know what that means. So look at scripture here, some interesting ones. This one in Romans 12 says this, beloved friends, this is Paul speaking. Beloved friends, this is in the Passion Translation. Beloved friends, I should start every sentence like that. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you. I like how calmly Paul says this. I encourage you to surrender yourself to God, to be his sacred living sacrifice. You know what sacrifice is, right? It's something that's been stabbed and burnt. Just meditate on that for a minute. <laughs> Beloved friends, I encourage you to surrender yourselves to be stabbed and sacrificed and burnt unto God and live in holiness. So this is the sacrifice. Experiencing all the delights of his heart. Do you get that? The delights of his heart is attached to holiness. I'm not talking about a holiness in order to, to get acceptance into your eternal life. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. But you've been, you've been touched for a reason. You've been touched to express the very image and power of Jesus Christ through you. And he says, and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his far heart, for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Think about that. Holiness is a genuine expression of worship. I thought it was this. I got hit in the head in Middleburg with a flag today. I did. I was trying to tell a lady she needed to move up a little closer to the stage, you know. Smack me right in the head. I mean, it wasn't intentional. So it's got a little bit of a, anyway, she hit me in the head, you know. It's, that's great. We're worshiping. We're jumping up and down. Jay and Josh and Erica, they all get us very excited. And we get excited. But, you know, the real worship starts on Monday morning. <laughs> and it's coming out of your burnt, stabbed flesh. As a sacrifice, one part of the Bible calls it a sweet-smelling aroma. That when you were persecuted or difficulty, and the Milo's, I want to tell you, in what you're in right now, there's a moment to take on the sufferings of Christ and experience something that smells even better than those flowers that you're producing. There's an aroma that can fill your house. I mean, there's a sweetness in some of the most desperate points in my life, like in a hospital bed or something like that. I felt some of the greatest peace in my life. Yeah. I really did. Cindy was there, she'll tell you. I mean, <laughs> it was not easy. But boy, there was just a sense of like, oh Lord. I mean, honestly, you come to a point in some of these difficulties in your life, you say, I, I can come or I can go. Paul did that. I can stay or I can leave. I mean, I want to stay because I have grandkids. <laughs> but Lord, if you want me to leave, then I'll, 
I'd love to be, I mean, I could go either way. I mean, you get to that place and you are in a moment. It's not, not a loss of hope. It's actually, you're stepping into a greater hope that, that you've ever felt before. But then you realize, but I'm not yet finished. There's so much more that God wants me to do. And so you're stepping into heaven, but you feel it. And then you feel the pull back to earth. Like I need to do what the Lord has called me to do. And so you come back, you know. You know, Thessalonians, or, or I think it's in Timothy, actually. Let me see, Thessalonians, one of those verses. First Thessalonians 4 says this, God did not call us, God did not call us to uncleanliness or uncleanness, but in holiness. Listen to this, this verse, for some reason I just saw this verse yesterday in a way I haven't seen it before. I don't know why, but I did. Verse, verse eight says, therefore, so read verse seven again because it's, it's a therefore connected to it. God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. He's called us to holiness, to understand that. He called us to purity. He's called you to say no to certain things, say yes to certain things, and say I'll pray about some other things. He's called you to center your life around circumstances that are going to undergird the direction that God's called you to. You are in this world, but not of this world. You are in this world, but not of this world. He says, therefore, he who rejects this, holiness, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing how many things in our circles that have holy attached to it? I mean, if you get married, you get married in holy matrimony. Holy, being separate. Holy being different. Holy inferred in the New Testament sense, sense inferred heavily as Christ-like, as Jesus-like. What would Jesus do in a situation? In fact, there's this amazing verse up here I want to show you real quick. And then I'm going to tie it all together here. In 1 Peter 1, it says, Gird up the loins of your mind. What in the world is that? Didn't know my mind had loins. Why do you gird up your loins? You gird up your loins in ancient times when you're getting ready to run. You pull up your tunic or your skirt. You pull it up so that you can run with your legs being free. And so Paul's, Peter says, gird up your loins of your mind. In other words, you pull something up in your mind. It says, be sober, which I believe is a major word to the church right now. It's a major church. A major word to the church, don't, don't think lightly of alcohol. I know people feel freedom in different ways, but there are some ways where you're stepping out of bounds to where God has called you to be, and it affects your spiritual life. He says, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you by the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to former lust as is your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Wow. Man, this is so important. I mean, we, we're in a, somewhere in the early 2000s, late 90s, uh, we had a tsunami of, of a message of grace that hit America and it was needed. I mean, people were in legalistic environments, bound by religion. They needed to understand who they were in Christ. But as what happens in the church many times, when you're trying to make a rod straight and it's bent, you have to bend it the other way far enough so that it will become straight. So you get an extreme that comes in on the other side. And there are extreme graces. I know every time I say that to someone, they go, whoa, the extreme grace is Jesus Christ. You know, and what I'm talking about is back in the 70s when this happened, they called it sloppy agape. <laughs> they called it greasy grace. Oh yeah, there's grace. There's holiness, there's righteousness. But that holiness is a call to purity. It's not like you can become a believer. I got two minutes left. It's not like you can become a believer and then all of a sudden say, hey, I'm forgiven, so I'm gonna live, live the life that I wanna live. The Lord calls us scripturally over and over again. Look at this one. Let's re repeat that one part again. Not conforming yourself to your former lusts as in ignorance, but he called you, he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Oh, he's quoting out of the Old Testament. That's the only place Jesus quoted from. 
Be holy, for I am holy. And Peter and Paul and all the rest of them. 22. Since you, everyone say you, you, have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. If I wanted to go to 2 Corinthians, I could. And I'm going to real quick. It says here. Come out from among them and be you be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. This is a call of God in our life. We're not hearing a lot in the church in America right now, not even here in this house. We are now. Why? Because there's been this interruption of creating our own theologies, our own relationships, interpreting God in our own understanding. We've created God in our image. But when the God of the Bible shows up, the first response for most people is they fall on their face before God. Samson is an amazing example of someone who was touched powerfully of God, had an amazing, he was a judge of Israel, had amazing potential, an outstanding call, was famous, long flowing hair, huge muscles, able to kill all kinds of enemies, you know. He was an amazing guy, but one thing happened. He went and he saw a prostitute, then met another woman named Delilah, which means delicate thing. And she began to lay with him, talk with him, encourage him, tell me your powers because she'd been given the promise of wealth and uh, money and fame and all kinds of stuff. So she had a motivation, you know. It was the enemy sending someone in to disrupt a judge of God. Went through all series. Tell me, what's the secret of your powers? Well, if you, if you tie them up, if you weave them through a loom, he gives them three different things. These crazy things. She does all of it. When he, and then she wakens him out of his sleep. He, he wakes up and shakes himself. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He shakes himself, breaks these things away because they are not the things that would hinder him. But finally, she pleads and pleads, that you really love me. If you really love me, it's the temptation to draw you out of righteousness and holiness into a life that's gonna end up destroying you. And sometimes as American Christians, we just walk wherever we feel we're being pulled to. Finally, he, lets, it, he lets, lets the secret out. He says, well, if you cut my hair, I lose my strength. And sure enough, she cuts his hair while he's sleeping and then yells, the Philistines are here, the Philistines are here. He wakes up and the Bible says something so dramatic. It says, he shook himself as before, but God was not, the Lord had left him. Can you imagine that feeling? They immediately gouged his eyes out, put him on a mill basically like a mule going around night and day, grinding, grinding, grinding. The man who had great destiny. Why is that, why is that story in the Bible? Because it's a picture of the purity of holiness and the ease that we can release and lose everything that God has promised for us. Let's all stand up together if we could. So what do we do? We repent. There's one big repentance in our life. It's called salvation. <laughs> But these, these course corrections are constant throughout our life. I mean, you say, how many times do you repent? I don't see it that way. I turn. I, how many times a day do you turn to the Lord? You're turning. You're adjusting your life. You don't want to be legalistic. You don't want to be lawless. You want to focus on the love of Jesus Christ. But here's a couple of things you can do. No, you're not, not going to do that. Let me tell you real quick while you're standing some theories that we have that I think the enemy wants to crush. Here's a theory. He accepted me just the way I am. Have you ever heard that from a Christian? Yeah, we all say so. He's accepted me just the way I am. The kingdom says Jesus will not leave you just as you are. So he accepted the way you are, but has called you to be conformed into the image of Christ. And it's a partnership. How about this one? God loves me regardless. Yes, but he calls you to be holy. He's my father. He's my friend. He's also holy. And ultimately, he's your judge. He's the Lord. Everyone loves the term father and loves the term friend. Lord, though, really in today's terms is boss. 
He's your boss. It's nice to have a boss that's your father. But even father bosses can be pretty direct sometimes. So this woundedness, this, this gentle, delicate thing that's upon Christians in America, like, oh, don't offend me. And, oh, they pushed back on my Facebook post. Oh, it's been, I unfriended them, though, you know. <laughs> Social media's got to be one of the most unholy places <laughs> there is. Oh, my God. Christians out there, wah, 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 you know, go back and forth like that. What's Jesus do? Sometimes you just have to really ask that. I know it sounds a little bit cliche, but what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do about this business deal? What would Jesus do about this, this house of life? What would Jesus do about how I'm relating with my spouse? How would Jesus, Holy Spirit, guide us into this, Lord. So here's the deal. This is not meant to be some big stress. It's meant to be a partnership with someone who really loves you, Holy Spirit. And so I ask Holy Spirit just to come into this room. I'm not here to put more grief or burdens upon people. I'm here to say, look, there's a way in holiness that's going to offer up the greatest sacrifices you would ever give to the Lord. He loved you so much, yield your life to Him. Walk in holiness before Him. What does that look like? It look like a lot of things. I can't get into your life, but the Holy Spirit's in your life. He's going to walk around with you and he's going to say, look, this may not seem bad, may not be difficult, but you need to stay away from that group. They're going to influence you. You need to not go to that location. It will influence you. Do you know when I ride my motorcycle, I've been a motorcycle guy for a long time, since I was 12. Um, I like guardrails. I've been on roads that when you don't have guardrails, unless you're crazy, you slow way down. You slow way down. Ooh, because you look, there's 3,000 foot drops going off there, you know. You get around there and you come, you power out of it. Come out of the curb, that's the fun part. You power out of it like, boom. Sometimes your back tire snaps into place and you take off. It's an amazing feeling, you know. A dangerous feeling. When there's guardrails though, I feel safe. I mean, I don't know this guardrail is gonna do that much on a motorcycle. The motorcycle will be saved, but I will go over the rail. But there's something about it that brings security. It's like, I feel like I can enjoy the ride. I feel like I can get where I need to go. You know, I've been through the dragon's tail down there, and it's, I think, 320 turns in like a 15-mile ride. It's just, oh, man, they got ambulances all up and down the mountain waiting for people. They do. Every day they have people get and problems, you know. <laughs> going down through that, boy, and the only thing that, it was so hard, I was so tense going through all these curves, you know, or leaning the bike and everything, but thank the Lord, we're in the most difficult parts. They, they understand what's happened before. And they've got these big guardrails there. And it's like, yeah, it's a reminder. I'm on a dangerous road. That is holiness. Holiness are guardrails in your life that's gonna give you greater freedom to enjoy everything that God has for you. In the midst of it, you're going to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Lord, I bless this church right now. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, I got good news. He is here today. We bless you right now that you would know the purpose of God. Jay's going to come up to pray for you and also pray for all the saints here too, the called out ones, the holy ones, that God's grace will be with you. I love you all. And uh, watch my, I do a daily devotional every day now in the morning. It's at different times. It's two minutes long. It's worth watching just to make a connection, sharing with you what's going on through my mind. Thursday night's the resistance. I forgot it this week. We did it a little late. But anyway, 30 minutes together, praying for the nation, praying for the election. Uh, we were in a big week coming up toward the election. Destinies of our nation are being held into balance. But let me tell you something. God is in control, Jay.